the fresh, Lord. I love what Jesus did with His disciples. He said, I'm going away, but so I want you to receive the Holy Spirit. He just breathed on them. I always see that um, as like a divine hongi. And uh, so when you're with you in uh, Tuako this morning or North Campus, great uh, for Dale and I to be here. But just, I don't want you to breathe on someone in this COVID era. It's probably not even politically correct, is it? But, um, <laughs> but you can sort of kind of, you know, allow the Lord to breathe on you. Is that okay? Yeah, amen. Just, just let Him do that. Just become aware of His breath afresh. Just if you are honging someone, you're very aware of the, the pressing of the noses, even of the exchange. But God reaches down even to His creation and breathes life. Still does that today. Did that with me this morning. I mean, as I was getting up, you become, like, become aware of Him. Holy Spirit, from the back to the front, we just say thank you now for your presence afresh. Wow. I come from a conservative, evangelical, reformed, theological, cessationalist background. Anyway, I am not that anymore. The first person I ever heard speak in tongues was me. I didn't even know what it was. They had to tell me. You know, like she, she introduced me to the Holy Spirit. I blame her being a backslidden Baptist. All right, that's all I can say. And um, she was hung. Please just sit down for a moment. I want to. I, I wanted to bring Dale up this morning because um, uh, we we did a uh, a wedding, a marriage seminar yesterday, which was brilliant. Uh, we haven't done one for I said ten years, but fifteen years probably. We haven't done one of those, and we really pulled something out of the bag that probably shouldn't be repeated ever again. Um, but um, we uh, we just we just love doing that. Uh, we've been married um, in this September 28th. I remembered, guys, remember your wedding anniversary. Winning all the time if you do that. Um, 28th September, and we've been married 48 years this coming September, which is great. Yeah, yeah, amen. So um, Dale is the um, Dale is the facilitator for so Bethel Sozo New Zealand, of which you have an amazing team here, and um, we honour them. And so I want to, Dale, just say hi uh, to you and um, all of that. So that'll be great. This is the lovely Dale. <laughs> Kia ora Tefano. What a privilege to be in your place. Thank you so much for your welcome in the Waikato. It's actually quite beautiful. We think we hog all the beauty down south, but I've been just pleasantly surprised and impressed by some of the beauty that you have in your amazing province. So it's just a real privilege to be here. And I just want to say, just very briefly, the Lord bless you and prosper you. As I've walked around your plant and I hear, and hear of the amazing uh, strategies and, and things, initiatives that are coming out of this place. I say again, the Lord bless you and prosper you. The reason why I say that, and you'll find this in a footnote in Psalm 139 and the Passion 29, one of them anyway. There's a footnote where it says where in the Jewish culture of the day, when people walk past other farmers harvesting their crop, they would shout out to them, the Lord bless you and prosper you. And I say to you, the Lord bless you and prosper you as I see you harvesting in the place where God has planted you. And I want to encourage you, wherever you are, in your work situations, the Lord bless you and prosper you. And, and we're maybe you're, you're in your family situations, you are harvesting. The Lord bless you and prosper you. You know, if Activate People could be a people that bless one another, not get jealous or envious or feel intimidated or feel like we're in competition, but rather cheer one another on as we move towards a common goal of prospering and blessing one another, that we're a people that have known to be blessing and encouraging others to prosper. So I want to encourage you this morning, and I say again, the Lord bless you and prosper you in your region and Waikato. 
Thank you. Amen. Oh, thanks, honey. You're right. Awesome. We, we met when we were 17, so we've known each other for over 50 years now, and it's just, um, just a real privilege uh, uh, to minister to Dale. We're semi-retired, um, which I don't quite know what that means, but um, I think I'm working harder now than I was, which retired people often say, but uh, we've been pastoring for um, well over 36 years, 37 years, full-time, and we were doing a youth ministry before then, and, um, and uh, that was a lot of fun as well. I uh, also worked with the YMCA, uh, for a while, way back, doing special needs classes, and um, and I uh, had so much fun with those guys, um, uh, who had real life challenges, and um, and so yeah, all of that. So we've been doing that. Met Dale, and um, and we just both had the call of God on our life, and uh, my call came when I was 11, and uh, Dale has an amazing story. She's got a bit of a once war warriors, um, Pakia once war warriors background. And um, she told some of that story yesterday, which is harrowing uh, for me because I came from Goody Two Shoes background, and um, and I didn't know any of that stuff that was going on except that I biked past her place every day, and I remember this little old state house, uh, and um, and I stopped there because it was on an intersection, and um, you know redid my my bike. Uh, gears and whatever you do, and, um, and went off again, not knowing my future wife was living in hell in that house. And, um, you know, just a amazing story of redemption. And, uh, and God, he, he, amazing when He comes into our lives because he, 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 re, he redeems us and lifts us. Come on, you weren't, you weren't the guy that, or the gal that you used to be. When Jesus gets involved in your life, you know, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you. You know, that's just like, you get that. That's like, you're the total package. You look in the mirror next time and go, dude, I'm the total package. It's awesome. So great to be here. Great to be, and uh, I have to mention Stanley because Stanley and I met um, again this morning, which was just remarkable. Um, and um, and I, I, I didn't recognise him. And I sort of kind of the, the obligatory, you know, kind of hug. And, um, and he goes, you know, what's your name? And he goes, you know my name. And I went, I was going to say, oh, it's Jesus. He's probably one of those religious people, you know. And, um, and, uh, and I'm looking at him going, you know my name? You came to Chennai. You, you prayed for my dad. You know, all, the, all those kind of things. We had this kind of real move of God. And I, I went, oh, it's, and, and he says, Stanley. And I went, oh, my goodness. What are you doing here? Like, that's amazing. That is amazing. And I, I just honour you and your family, what your father carried. And, and we saw him so released that day. I, I, I love that. Because um, you don't know what you don't know. You know, because you, you know, you're in a church and I see people and I, you just go, oh, there they are. They're beautiful. They're in church. They look so happy and full of the Holy Ghost and power and singing in tongues. And you go, man, you guys are on fire. You know, it's like, and... Hello, Testing. Some of you more friendly guys, you shouldn't sit at the back. You should sit up here because it's like, it's way more encouraging. You know, like so these guys down. Oh, no, they're smiling now. So that's good. That's, that. <laughs> and, and, and Stanley's dad got released in that meeting. And, um, and, and you came up and your brother came up and said, Daddy, you called him Daddy, didn't you? Because it's like, yeah, Dad, Daddy is dancing. And I went going, good for Daddy. You know, like, that's great. And, um, and he said, no, no, you don't understand. Daddy doesn't believe in dancing in church. And I said, no, I'm against it too, personally. <laughs> it's not true. Not true. My old sensational self was. But anyway, apart from that, all cards or anything. We had three hymns, you know, up on the board and don't look at the hers and you'll go straight to heaven. You know, like that. Anything, any variation of that burning for all eternity. You know, so that's, that was us. Like, that was, great. that was great. That was not good news. It's not, that's not the evangel. That is not great news. You know, when I heard the gospel for the first time, I went, yes, please. Jingoes. <laughs> and so, um, Daddy got released and, and just a whole bunch of stuff changed in Stanley's family. And uh, I want to honour this young man this morning. Anybody younger than me is a young man. So, um, um, and so I want you to put your hands together and bless this man here. Bless this man. We bless you in Jesus' name. Now, 
Stanley, I only did that because I am a preacher that loves um, someone playing uh, behind me, you know? And um, so if you're going to work with me, aren't you? You're staying there. Amen. That's good. Shoot. Thank goodness for that. That is so good. Wow. The great secret of the gospel, and I was sharing with the people before, uh, is found in Colossians 1.27. And Paul wrote this to the early church and uh, he made it very, very clear. He wrote a whole, you know, two thirds of the uh, New Testament was written by Paul, worth listening to. But he comes to this place where he says, this is the secret to your Christianity. And, um, you know, all of us want to know what the secret is. The New Ages want to know it. They wrote a book about it. They made, the, they made the video, DVD, you know, audio tape, the teaching series. It's on Netflix right now. The secret, you know, and, you know, the, the, the power of attraction. When Dale saw me, she got that power of attraction, you know, like that. When I saw a mini skirt, I got attraction twice plus and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Then she was 17, mate, you know, just, yeah, come on. Don't you get excited, honestly. It's like... <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, though. You used to be 17, eh? Surprising. And, uh, and so the, 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 the whole deal, you know, so I used to be 17 out uh, here. And, um, and so, um, you know, the amazing thing is that, that Christ becomes so much part of us. So Christ within us is the hope of glory, yes? Okay. And, and as my friend Dr. Ray Andrews says, he said, the only hope of God getting glory out of us is Christ in us. That's the truth. This, the, 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 the New Living Translation simply says, this is the secret, full stop. Jesus Christ lives within you. And so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead resurrects us every day. Not just out of bed in the morning to get to work on time, but resurrects us to the newness of life. We are new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 just literally says uh, all of that. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are what? New creations. The old has passed away. Amen. And the new has come. You know, so that um, Galatians 2.20, you know, I am crucified with Christ. You know, um, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. So we've got the secret. Christ lives in me. Jesus lives in me. When you get connected to me, you get connected to Jesus. You know, where, where um, one can put a thousand to flight, the Old Testament say two can put 10,000 to flight. So Dale and I are powerful together in what we do. And you are powerful when you join with your friend or with your, with your, your wife, your husband, whatever, and you join with ministry, you join with church. You've got to be more powerful together. And so I encourage you uh, in all of that. And so it's been an amazing uh, journey for us to, uh, to go on and to, uh, to be part of and, uh, and just to know that He lives within us. What is Christ? Christ is the anointed one. That's what it literally means. And so uh, uh, I had a man recently react because he had demons in him. And, um, and they, are, they live in New Zealand too, and in New Zealanders, just in case. FYI, you know, like, <laughs> and some people are like, oh, you know, and even in my cessationalist church when I grew up, you know, they were there. It's amazing. There was a lady called Molly. And every Sunday morning, Molly would sit right in front of me to my left-hand side. I was a little boy growing up. And I knew what was going to happen every Sunday. If we had 100 services on a Sunday, which we didn't, we had three, um, like you guys, but we had communion at every one. Communion was a big deal in our church, all right? So that was good. In fact, if you miss communion, they would provide another communion service after the three services exclusively for you, even if it was only you, all right? And so that was like, we were fully committed uh, to bread and wine, all right? Or bread and grape juice. And, um, or it was whatever it was in those days. But the amazing thing was, even as a little boy, um, recognizing that, that, that there is other spiritual worlds, I used to watch as the communion uh, bread would come along and Molly, little old Molly, Miss Deverell, she would, she would sit and she had a fur, what they called a fur stole. But it's real, it kind of had eyes. I was getting a good position to see the eyes. And if I could, if it was near me, I'd kind of flick it around a bit, you know, kind of to see it. It had, a, it had its whole face on there. Apparently you can't do that stuff anymore. You know, it's PC, but I thought it was really cool, you know. And anyway, so this little fox fur thing she had on and she'd all be dolled up and styly and she'd have the bread and thank you, Jesus, and pass the bread along and all of that. But, 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 but I knew what was going to happen because it was always the same every Sunday. So you'd come along and the, and the wine would come and, Lady next to her would take it, then pass the wine. She'd take it, she'd hold it, and I'd see her hand start to shake. She'd take it, and then she'd, she'd do it, she'd try again. 
and she'd, she'd put it in her mouth and then boom, she'd have a grand mal seizure. She was an epileptic. And, uh, you know, as a, and, and listen, you know, I understand that, but I was seven and I could figure it out. All the elders, including my dad, would drag her out and deal with her. No woman was helping her, those were the days. And, uh, and, and just like, she needed some feminine help, honestly. You know, she needed, yeah, anyway. And, and so they get her out. And I remember sneaking out one day and I looked down as she frothed and foamed and shook and, sh- and, and I felt so sorry for her. I remember, I felt so sorry for her, seven years old. I go, why doesn't someone pray for her? It's not rocket science. You know, Acts 10 just said, Jesus went about doing good and undoing the works of the enemy, as one translation says, and healing the sick. And then he sent us, us out to do that. It's called the Great Commission, not the Great Omission. It's that, that commission that all of us get to be able to go tell people about Jesus and then follow it up with power. Yes, and that's amazing. Wow. And we know that. I'm preaching to the choir. I get that. But when was the last time you prayed for someone and they got healed? When was the last time that you, you, you saw someone, you know, manifest? And you know, we're talking about Christ within us. Christ means the anointed one. I was praying for a young man the other night, all everybody was around him and all that kind of stuff. And I was uh, just speaking in tongues as I, I do. I speak in tongues more than all of you. And, and, uh, and, and quietly, I didn't want to offend anybody from my old church. And, uh, and so I, I was just like doing all of that. And, um, and then I came up to him and I just said, I want to, so many people have prayed for me over the years. I just want to pray for you. I laid my hands on him and, uh, and he immediately just changed. He just pushed, he just flicked his, his, his arm up and, um, and, 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 and goes, get away from me. <laughs> he's just going to be baptised, you know, like, he's just like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look up, get away from me. Go, Whoops. <laughs> Try walking on air. And, uh, and, and you go, well, that, that's odd. <laughs> and, and, and then I stepped up into him, which I probably shouldn't have done. But I'm that kind of guy. And I, I stepped up into him. I looked him in the eye and, his, and, and I said, I can deal with that if you want. And he goes, get away from me. Like, and his whole family who are Christian. Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> what the heck? This has only happened about three weeks ago. It was crazy. He said, like, what the heck? And, um, and, and so um, yeah, he got baptised. He never came back to our church. He went to a brethren church that following week. S- safer, because no one's going to come up to you speaking in tongues. Like, that's going to be real safe, you know. And, uh, and so that's good. But what, what was happening, there was a kingdom connecting with another kingdom. And he was just, he'd been away, he'd been on drugs, he'd been uh, the backslidden guy in the family, all that kind of stuff. And no, nobody had done due diligence and just taking him through, you know, kind of some early discipleship, just saying, hey, let's get some stuff cleaned up in your life. And we kind of conveniently forget that because it's messy. But Jesus went around doing good, undoing the works of the enemy and praying for people to be set free so that they would sit at his feet clothed and in, his right, and in, in their right minds. Thank you, Ian. That was wonderful. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. But that's our ministry. That's our, not my ministry. Well, it is my ministry, but it's, it's our ministry. It's our ministry. You can do that. And I remember his sister coming up to me afterward and says, Pastor Ian, what was that? And I went, you know very well what that was. His parents came over. Said, Ian, what's the story? What was that? And I went, you know very well what that was. You've seen that before. And they kind of looked sheepish. And then his sister said to me, what was it? And you know, the Holy Spirit always tells you. And I didn't even consider to ask at that point. It was just a pushback from the, another kingdom. A kingdom I didn't want to have anything to do with and don't have anything to do with anymore. I used to. I did my first seance in my youth group church in a cessational church. Because if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, there's a whole bunch of young people in that church wanting to believe in something supernatural. So we did seance. Yeah. Anywho. And so she, 
she said, what, what would you call that? And I said, oh, I was Antichrist. It was kind of like, like, oh, we're in. And she was like, shocked. And then she, she said, but he loves Jesus. I said, yeah, he does. He does love Jesus. But he's got unclaimed territory in his heart. He's got areas that he will not give up to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed one or the anointing. Antichrist just simply means anti-anointing. People come into churches and twitch all the time and go, I'm not going back to that church. I'm going to find something that I'm more comfortable in. What is that? That's a pushback from a kingdom. I don't feel comfortable when they, when I, I guarantee you there was people here this morning and um, you don't have to, don't, please don't put up your hand. But I guarantee you, when, when the music team were playing and we started singing in the Spirit like that, that something went off in you and went, I'm finding this very uncomfortable. I'll work through it. They'll get over it and sometime and later on they'll be like me. Guarantee it. Because I'm used to working in Pentecostal churches. Shock horror, you're in a Pentecostal church. All right? I remember saying that to our church when we came in Vicargo years ago. I said, I said it from the pool. Well, it's great. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in these things, blah, blah, blah. And a gal came up to me I've known for a, a many, many years because <clears throat> I was brought up in, in, in Invercargill. And she said, we're, we're not a Pentecostal church yet. I mean, not now, but wait for it. I've just arrived. <laughs> Heck, I know what we're dealing with. <laughs> and, and part of, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna elaborate on this tonight. So I'm giving you fair warning, all right? Um, because I'm a revivalist. I'm not, I'm not into revivalism. Can I just say, look, they're coming to the altar call already. That's outstanding. Come on. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Woo! <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you know, I'm not into revivalism as I'm not into Pentecostalism. Because the isms are the things that get us into trouble. And so we want, you know, I just want to encourage tonight when you come out, you know, I'll be talking about revival and that. You know, we, we've all heard the sermon, Jonathan Edwards, great reformer, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Man, I preached that better than he did. You know, I was more scared. I was like holding on to pillows and slide, lest I slide into hell, all that kind of stuff. You know, like, and, I, and, and that was never good news. Now go Jonathan Edwards, but he was seeing God for what he was in the era that he was in and, and preached out of that. We all do that, by the way. We all do that. We filled it. You only have to go on YouTube to find that out. Go and have to go on Facebook, social media. You'll find that people are in that deal right now and they're preaching out of the filters that they have on. I'm not into sinners in the, hang- in the hands of an angry God anymore. I am into sinners in the hands of a loving Father. Because the key of the gospel is the prodigal story or the loving Father story. When the moment he lifts his head up from the corn, the, the corn cobs, you know, he goes... <laughs> Like, like there's got to be, I, I'm going to be a servant in my father's house. And it was like his father heard that. It was carried on the wind. And here was this man. Here was this great landowner. Everybody knew, property owner. The, and here was this kid that brought so much shame unto his father. And yet his father waited for him to come. <laughs> waited for him. We had an old guy in our church. And I remember him coming to me one night. And uh, he, uh, he said, um, my wife's been pestering me about becoming a Christian. You know, leaving tracks on the toilet seat and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, well amen, good, you know. But, you know, like he, he was, he, anyway. And he came around and he said, um, if I'm going to get board the, on board this thing, he said, I need to, I, I need to clear, the, clear my conscience. And so he told me a whole bunch of stuff. I felt like a Catholic priest, you know, honestly. It's just like confessional, you know. My father can play dominoes better than yours can. And, uh, you know, just like, away you go. But he wanted to clear something up. The moment that Jesus came into his life, which wasn't that night, by the way, I could have led him to the Lord. But the Lord was leading him to the Lord. The Father was embracing this elderly man now who had been in all kind of shonky deals, business deals. He was very good at doing that kind of stuff. Having an affair, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. Um, He was drunk all the time. He was quite addicted to alcohol and all that kind of stuff. He said, I'm going to get on board with this thing. He said, someone needs to know. And I said, someone already knows. And he said, the very fact that you're here doing that, it's part of coming from the pig pen. It's coming to the arms of a loving father. 
And three days later, he walked into church with a tie on. I said, Bob, even I don't wear a tie. And, and, and he, goes, he goes, I'm after your job. He was a joker, you know, those guys, you know, like he ran trucking firms and all that, right, hard man, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, after your job, and he, and, he, and he had a Bible underneath his arm, which is big enough to choke a mule. It was like enormous, like, dude, you, that's not a Gideon Bible that you stole from a motel, isn't it? Said, no. He said, this is a monster thing. This is like, you know, this is like the original manuscripts bound into leather, you know, and, but it's, it still had cellophane on it. Isn't that lovely? He said, I wanted to open it in church. Yeah, it was amazing. He said, it was terrible buying it. He said, I asked someone in the church, where do you buy Bibles? And they said, oh, you go down to the bookstore, the Mana stores. And he goes, I walked up and down outside that place for ages. See, that's the kingdom pushing back. What, what he was involved in. So I want to go, he said, I couldn't go in. I'm, I'm, I'm walk, go in and, and then he said, I'm, I'm psyching myself up to get a Bible. And, and so I, I, I get a Bible, I need a Bible. I don't even know what, you know, Bible. So I get a Bible, right, here I go. He gets through the door, walks right up to this guy who actually owned Mana stores throughout New Zealand because they started in Invercargill. Thank you for that overwhelming round of applause. And um, no good thing can come out of Invercargill. Anyway, it's just like, and, and so he goes in there and then he said, I get it right up. And he said, and then this clown, like who's running the store, which was my friend, he, go, he goes, I want a Bible. He goes, what kind? <laughs> so he said, I didn't, he said, I just felt like I was running out. And he goes, and then he finally gets one, works him through all the things. And he says, I just wanted to get out of there. Gives him the Bible. Gets it and he says, can you put it in, can you put it in a bag? Like, don't, put it in a bag. He said, I was like buying a penthouse magazine. You know, it's like, it's like it's trying to hide the thing. You know, and, uh, he's, and he hid it until Sunday and it was still in the cellophane. Within three months, he's smuggling Bibles into China. Amazing. Amazing. He went on a missions trip to, to China. Some guy picked his wallet going across a crossing in the middle of communist China. Right, so not Hong Kong, I'm talking about. And they were being watched. The whole team, Dale was with them. And it was great, you know, because Bob's saved, but not yet sanctified. So the guy picks his wallet. So he goes, Oi! <laughs> and, and he said, the only, everybody stopped except the guy that stole his wallet. And he said, that's the trick. You've got to know how, to, how humanity works, you see. And so he grabbed this guy and he kicked him so hard up the backside that he lifted right off the ground, you know, like that. And, um, and um, he may have done some damage, I don't know. And, and, uh, and, and so landed again, grabbed his wallet back off him and he was going to deck him, but he thought he'd better not because he was in communist China because they're being watched. Dale and the team are freaking out because what do you do with these new Christians that come, you know, with Bibles and cellophane and all that kind of stuff? What's happened? He said, because when God gets in his life, he just changes you. He always upgrades you. He comes in, we say, oh, I have to be better. You can never be better. I've tried that. I've really tried, you know, being, I, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be more holy. <laughs> this is not, your, you've had your turn, Dale. <laughs> For those of you on the live stream, she just said good luck with that. And that's true. That's very true. I'll try to be more sanctified. I'll try to be like, more like Jesus, swanning around doing all this stuff. No, no, we operate. He operates through you. I know that's really surprising. I was picking on Andrew this morning um, and, I, and I, I just did, see, let's look at Andrew, amazing. Love your haircut, mate. And, uh, but he's got Christ in him. He's Christ in him. Yes. And, and so is he Jesus? No, he's Andrew. But Andrew has had an upgrade. And Jesus leaks out of Andrew. Sometimes Andrew doesn't like being in Andrew. He doesn't like being in him. But Jesus is okay. Andrew stuffs up sometimes. You don't have to agree with me. Who knows Andrew? No, don't say that. No, no. Don't put your hands down. See, you all get excited and put your hands up when there's something of picking on someone else. Like, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus sticks with you when you were doing all kinds of things that you shouldn't be doing. He did that with me. 
I know that. He, he, even from goody two-shoes background, you know, Jesus had to work on me. And there were times I didn't feel comfortable in myself. But Jesus said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And He comes and He, he brings that incredible touch of revival uh, to our lives. He revives us, He restores us, He redeems us. It's like when, you know, revival is just simply um, uh, something coming back to life again that's, that, that's lived. I, I, I could pick on this table here. <whistles> Look at that. That table there. That table, that's not bad for 68, eh? 67, all right, it's all right. 68 in November, all right? So that's near, near, near. And so um, it, it, this, is, this is like dead. It's never lived. I mean, it, it, the wood's probably plastic anyway. Um, so it's been made up, you know, and you know, probably put on the thing, never lived. But if you were up here and you were dead, you'd go, well, like, give him a poke. He's, no, he's dead. Get the doctor up. He's dead. Yes, dead. Go, goes back. We have to, re- what? Revive them. Can't revive that thing. An adamant odd you. But someone who has carried life and knows life. And revival is about touching individuals and churches that brings them back to a place where they once were. Renew our first love. And, 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 and of course, that whole area of revelation is so in, incredibly, incredibly um, powerful. This is, this is an Acts, Acts chapter 19. When Apollos was in Corinth, Paul travelled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he said. We really need the infilling of the Holy Spirit, all right? Now we get that when we, when, we, when we are born again. The moment as an 11 year old, I gave my life to Christ. I walked down the front and I said yes to Him. Um, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't move in healing power. I didn't have an overflow in my life, but I was absolutely caught up in an awareness of His presence from that day to this, all right? And so that's, that, that was amazing. Did I stuff up on the way? Did I want to get out of myself? Yes, I did. But Christ was in me and became the hope of glory in me. All right. And so he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He says, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. He said, what baptism did you experience? Now you guys are gonna be learning about this, I think next week and the week after, both baptism in water and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Please attend because I know that Pastor Sharon is gonna unpack this in a great way for this church. That's gonna be sensational. I'm really excited about that when I heard. And if I can contribute some small part of that today and tonight, we pray for people moving the prophetic and all that kind of stuff. We wanna be able to have great fun in that. And, and he said, what baptism did you experience? He said, they were a baptism of John. That's a baptism of repentance. So we can, we can be happy with that. Even the young man that I, I, I saw coming to baptism down who knocked my hand out of the way, manifested. And when her sister said, you know, what demon is that? Or what, what do you think it is? And I said, Antichrist. And she, she said this, I didn't tell you this before, but she said this. <gasps> he called our grandmother Antichrist this afternoon in the same voice. Oh, well, there's a bit of a clue, eh? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Real giveaway. And they said, we received the baptism of John. Paul said John baptism was called for repentance from sin, but John himself told people to believe in the one that would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul laid his hands on them and the Spirit came on them. They spoke in other tongues and they prophesied. And there was about 12 men in all. The point that I wanted to make from that, well, it was 23 years from Pentecost, from the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, if the early church could forget or some members of the early church could forget that the power of God had fallen and had just stayed in one particular teaching, one particular revelation that got them out of stuff, but never received the power that was preached 23 years ago to the entire, to the birthday of the church, the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, all of that kind of stuff. If they had forgotten that in 23 years, what have we forgotten in 2,000 years? We need another Pentecost. We need another outpouring of the Spirit. I can't magic that up. Only the Holy Spirit can because it's not magic. I can wave my hands and do my thing and and operate in the call that I've been given. But ultimately, it's not down to me. It's down to you. 
How hungry are you? What kind of capacity do you have for a move of God? Does a move of God turn you off? Does a move of God attract you in some way? Does it repel you? What are the things that you have always filtered your Christianity, praise and worship through? Or they say, oh, they're worshipping too long. I'm going to get a coffee while they get over that and I'll come back for the Word because I love the Word. That goes on in churches all the time. All the time. That's why online stuff so so happens. Hey there, you're still online with me? Good on you. I love you. <laughs> and stay. There's a lot of people get saved online. A lot of people hear. They, a lot of people check you out. The front door is not the front door anymore. The internet is the front door. And they've checked you out six months before they come in here. We've had people come into our church in Invercargill and literally come and go, oh, Simon, it's so good to meet you. And Simon's looking at them. He's our worship pastor. And he, they go, they go, he goes, who are you? <laughs> I like, they, they know him. They know all his songs. And uh, because they've been watching him online for six months or more. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you guys are yeah, magic. That's magic. They just drop out of the sky. It doesn't take long for time to pass and it doesn't take long for fire to fade 